Welcome to the Meb Faber Show, where the focus is on helping you grow and preserve your wealth. Join us as we discuss the craft of investing and uncover new and profitable ideas, all to help you grow wealthier and wiser. Better investing starts here. Meb Faber is the co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Cambria's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Cambria Investment Management or its affiliates. For more information, visit cambriainvestments.com. Today's podcast is brought to you by Esther's Wine Shop. I love drinking wine, but like most, I'm pretty clueless when it comes to buying it. That's why I outsource the selection to my friends, Catherine and Tug Coker, the proprietors of Esther's. Last year, Food & Wine Magazine named Catherine one of their Sommeliers of the Year. The LA Times called it the best wine bar in Southern California, also calling it a high ceiling temple of vinous pleasure that doubles as a retail store by day and chill, intimate wine bar by sundown. Right now, Esther's offering listeners of the Meb Faber Show a 20% discount on all month-to-month wine club memberships for the rest of 2018 with the code MEB. So even if you're not in Los Angeles, you can order amazing wines from Esther's while enjoying big savings. And if you're in a state that Esther's doesn't ship to, come on out to LA and I highly encourage you to stop in Esther's for an amazing experience. Drop me in an email and I'll even join you. Yet whether you're ordering online or going there in person, you're gonna love Esther's. So to browse Esther's wine selection, just go to esterswineshop.com. And remember, Use promo code MEB for 20% off on all month-to-month wine club memberships for the rest of 2018. And now on to the show. Welcome podcast listeners. It's holiday time. We have another amazing show for you today in our cannabis investing series. Our guest has spent over a decade in Asia as a senior exec with Goldman and Nomura. He's now a managing partner at Casa Verde Capital, a VC firm focused exclusively on the cannabis industry and other related business ventures. Welcome to the show, Kern Wadera. Thank you for having me. So, Kern, you're local in LA. Should have dragged you into the studio, but <laughs> great to meet you. We don't meet too many Goldman execs that then turn into cannabis investors. So I thought it'd be fun to hear a little bit about your origin story. Casa Verde has been around for a few years and we're familiar, but most of our audience probably isn't. Maybe give us a quick overview of your pathway to getting Casa Verde up and running. Yeah, sure. So I think I've had a bit of a, call it bifurcated career, but really running simultaneously at, at the same time. One has been incredibly traditional. I joined Goldman Sachs and the equities division out of college, starting in New York, then San Francisco, then Hong Kong, and eventually ending up in India in 2006 to help establish the firm's first uh, front office in the country. So I was in Bombay helping to build that equities business. And then I went and did something similar for Nomura as they were establishing their presence in India. And then more recently was looking after Asia X Japan trading for them out of Hong Kong. So that was one side of my life, which was much more sort of traditional in the institutional world. And then before that, actually before I've been Goldman, I've always been a pretty active entrepreneur and investor. I started my first business in college, which was looking at uh, doing new media and digital media consulting for record labels and artists, which is how I started coming out to Los Angeles. I was in Boston at a young age. And then when I got to India, and in many ways, people look at my career and, and think there's just these massive sort of pivots. But in certain ways, I think it's all very cohesive in a way. I moved to India, and I was really excited about getting to Asia immediately, uh, as quickly as I could once I graduated college, because I could see the, the massive opportunity and economies booming and, and building. And that's what India was at that time and, and, and still is. So what, when I got to India, in addition to my role at Goldman, became really active as an entrepreneur and investor there, helped start a, a digital media business, which now has you know an 80 person staff and has been funded by you know big VCs in, in the US and in India. I uh, was an early investor in what's now become the largest India dedicated hedge fund. I was just always very active and, and knew that's where I would want my trajectory in my career to go if I left the institutional world. And so when, when I did do that eventually in 2015, I came to LA and started poking around as to where I should be spending my time, initially thinking it it would be a little bit more 
cross-border Asia, US related, given my background, and got introduced to the cannabis space and became incredibly excited because what we were seeing was explosive growth, similar to what you know I had witnessed in Asian markets over the last decade, and also starting to really see this talent transfer of individuals from Silicon Valley, from Fortune 500, from Wall Street, now coming into the space. But what I didn't see was really a institutional platform to really support those new businesses that were that were growing in the cannabis space. So that really drove a lot of my excitement. But then even with all those sort of positive points, it took me about a year before I, I really sort of settled on my path and, and what I was going to be doing in cannabis. Casa Verde as a platform had existed uh, before I, I joined my partners I'd known for, for many years before that. Uh, but I, I sort of took over in the summer of 2016 and, you know, really made it like my big sort of coming out, right? Like emailed my entire network and let everyone know that this was the, the path I was pursuing. And even though that was only a couple of years ago, even at that time was a, was a pretty big step. And certainly I think shocked a lot of people as to sort of what I was going to be doing and pursuing next. But of course, as the industry has evolved and has gotten so much more acceptance, it now, I think, at least in retrospect, looks like a, a, a pretty solid move. Well, it's funny because, you know, rarely do you have a product that's been around for thousands of years that all of a sudden really only hits its stride <laughs> in, in the modern times. But I, I'd love to get a an overview kind of in your words where, you know, you guys mentioned there's a quote that says, you know, you, you maintain a view that the cannabis industry will be among the most compelling investment themes of our generation. So maybe talk a little bit about, you know, what you see as sort of the why now, why cannabis of opportunity. It's a very simple answer in some ways. And then as you really dig into the cannabis space, you really start uncovering how much opportunity there really is, right? So in the way you were saying it, you're absolutely right. It's been around for thousands of years. If you've lived anywhere in the US, even growing up, it has not been incredibly hard to uh, acquire from the the black market. And, and depending on where you were in, in the US, whether California or on the East Coast or even Middle America, had various differing levels of, of stigma attached to it. But obviously, this existing black market, you know, what we estimate to be a $100 billion industry in the US alone has been there. It was always there. So I think in certain ways, it was obvious as we transition into a legal market, and you know this is globally, uh, and moving out of the gray black market and into a more sort of sophisticated consumer product, there's just incredible opportunity. I think what's been, what we've really started to realize now is that there's so many avenues in how consumers will interact with the plant. And I think that is something that for lots of people is just being discovered and understood now. Now, you know, if you're in California where we've had a medical, more or less quasi legal market for, for 20 years before legalization, there was a much more sort of advanced understanding and people were using cannabis for medicinal benefits. But I think in the rest of America, it, it's now just starting to get uncovered as to, hey, you know, whether I'm you know, a senior citizen, or I'm a soccer mom, or the sort of vast demographics beyond the, the stigmatic stoner that, that that was thought of before, there's a, there's a whole range of products for you to consume and, and a way for you to interact with cannabis, a lot of it which has nothing to do with stereotypically how we think of, uh, of cannabis as something that you use, you know, recreationally only to get high. So whether you're talking about nutraceuticals, whether you're talking about form factor, Cannabis has historically just been linked with smoking. And the idea now that there's beverages and edibles and topicals and, you know, a, a whole range of ways to even consume, it really is starting to open, you know, people's minds about uh, about the plant in, in, in a way that they had never really thought about it before. So I think that's what really got got me excited, right? The, the year that, that, that I spent sort of evaluating the space and really getting a deeper understanding of the medicinal elements, the wellness elements, and then also the recreational elements. As you guys started thinking about it, you obviously have this massive opportunity. And part of it reminds me a little bit about late 90s, early 2000s internet, where it's very clear that this industry is going to be booming. I just went to the big marijuana cannabis conference in Vegas, which for someone who goes to a lot of conferences, was certainly unlike any conference I've ever been to, <laughs> because you see a full spectrum 
of a lot of money washing around and, and a lot of probably businesses that are going to be multi-billion dollars and a lot of them that will, will flame out. Talk to me a little bit about the current political landscape before we get into to more specific um, sort of investing concepts and segments. I, I'd love to hear. It's hard to talk about cannabis without talking about the landscape in the U.S. and internationally and kind of how the politics shape the industry. Right. So, of course, the one big issue with investing in cannabis and, and, and the problem that, that lots of people end up having when they assess the space is that there's this big divide, right? Everyone is reading about how new states are coming online, whether it's for recreational use or for a medicinal market. That continues to evolve. But at the federal level, federal government still views cannabis as a Schedule One substance, which is, you know, as bad as it can get from, from, from that perspective. We view it as, as badly as we would view any other drug, which of course is, is ludicrous if you know anything about cannabis, but there's a whole historical context that goes back to, you know, reefer madness in the twenties and thirties, all the way through the Nixon and Reagan era, where, you know, none of these things were, were ever really uh, resolved or, you know, reevaluated, just kept getting stricter and stricter. So that divide makes for lots of challenges. However, I think if you look at it from a momentum of, of what's happening politically, it's certainly becoming clear that in the U.S., and obviously we're just talking U.S. right now, things are evolving dramatically. And you're starting to see a lot of support now in the Senate and in Congress from representatives who want to bring the cannabis economy to, to their jurisdictions. And I think that has now started to drive a lot of activity and legalization across the U.S., and I think ultimately will force the federal government to rethink their cannabis policies. So there are a couple of initial bills in front of Congress at the moment that we feel very confident that will get passed, which will be helpful. The first is the States Act, which is a basically says that the federal government can't interfere into cannabis businesses as they evolve and develop in the state uh, level takes away the, a lot of risks associated with it, with their business at the moment. And the other is the, the farm bill, which is much more focused around hemp, but hemp, you know, which is basically cannabis, the same cannabis plant with, with a much lower content of THC also has a, you know, can extract CBD, which is another part of the, the cannabis plant, which has been linked to wellness and anti-inflammation and a lot of the medicinal benefits that are not associated with THC, which is much more about the high. So I think in the U.S., the momentum is fairly positive. And to be completely honest with you, this current dislocation between federal and state governments is what's been a, a huge advantage for funds like ours, because it does keep a big chunk of investors and corporates out of the space and allows us to sort of take advantage of that at, at the moment. And then, sorry, more, more broadly, internationally, the same thing is happening, um, except a lot of governments at, at their own federal levels are now moving to legalize both for you know adult recreational use and also for the medical perspective. So Canada being the largest, which just you know a couple months ago turned into a fully recreational market. So it's the first G7 country to ever have gone through that transition, which is very exciting. Uruguay ha has been legal for some time. And now sort of across the globe, but heavily in South America and in Europe and obviously North America, we're starting to see real changes take place. It almost always starts with a with a medical legalization of, of some sort and then transitions into uh, adult use markets uh, down the line. So I think the global political sort of support for for cannabis is, is as strong as it's ever been. You touched on a couple of points that I think are really accurate. The first is the expanding marketplace. I mean, I know so many friends and family that have never remotely been use cases for some sort of cannabis product that are now totally fine whatsoever with with utilizing CBD oil to sleep or whatever it may be. And the second, the politics, I think it's funny because it's always humorous to see how tax revenue and when things start to generate billions of dollars of money change politicians' <laughs> perception very, very quickly. I want to start to talk a little bit about the investing side now. So you guys would love to hear kind of the decision to position yourself on the private side because easily you could have said, you know what, maybe we'll do a public fund or maybe you will at some point. Uh, I don't know. But uh, what was what's the kind of original thesis on 
you guys have done, I think, about a dozen uh, investments so far. W- what are you guys looking for? Why did you pick private? What are what's the specific segments you're uh, you're thinking about targeting? Good question. So I think at the end of the day, we're all looking to get exposure to the same basic theme, right? Which is that there's this massive cannabis industry that is developing and growing. Legalization is taking shape worldwide. How do I get exposure to that theme? And as an investor in in general, you know, depending on what levels of access you have, there were only a, a few routes available to you. One is, as you mentioned, the public markets, which, as you know very well, and I'm sure you've been speaking about or, or will speak about to, to other folks, is incredibly volatile, trades at certain times, absurd multiples. And while you can certainly make money trading these names, at certain points, it's very similar to the sort of late 90s kind of dot-com bubble you were, you were referring to, right? There's just a lot of euphoria and to some degree, a lot of scarcity value, which is driving up the prices of some of these names. And they're all trading on, you know, sort of 2020 revenue estimates and, and, and beyond because, you know, the, the true market has, has yet to completely shape out. On revenue estimates, I heard one of the guys speak at the institutional conference that you were on a panel at, and uh, you may have heard the same guy speak where he said, you know, you just can't analyze cannabis companies on uh, with traditional valuation metrics. And I just kind of like, like <laughs> back of the back of the room, my, my jaw hit the floor. I'm like, literally, that's exactly what people used to say about tech companies. Um, I can't believe this guy said that with a straight face. It's amazing. And, and you know, like, you know, I wasn't in the market when the tech bubble was, was, was happening. But, you know, my, my, my brother would, would had just joined a, a tech boutique investment bank at that point. And I remember the stories that you would base valuations on comps such as that, hey, this company has 20 PhDs and it's sold for X million dollars. This new company has 30 PhDs, like therefore, right? Like using crazy multiples. And while it's not that, may not be that directly ab- absurd in the cannabis space, a lot of it is based on, you know, metrics that are that are hard to value, right? Like they acquired another million square feet of real estate. Like, does that actually mean anything right now? Uh, you know, it's, but using that as a guide towards a uh, higher and higher valuation. So it's, it's pretty incredible to watch and we're definitely seeing it happen. The consequences of that are, are starting to already take shape. And I think you'll, you'll see a lot more volatility in the public names because there's not you're letting euphoria now sort of take hold as opposed to reasonable fundamental sort of analysis. So like I was saying, the public markets had their challenges. And then a lot of what, you know, and being in California, I'm sure, you know, you saw this as well. A lot of the opportunities to other individuals across the country were sort of much more focused on, hey, my friend or my cousin, you know, has land or they've applied for a license and or we're going to start a cultivation or we're going to start a store. It was much more direct into one particular opportunity, which, again, you know, has a lot of concentration risk for people who want to get exposure to the theme. So anyway, we didn't necessarily see a great way to get exposure to the theme. And that's when, you know, we started doing a lot of analysis into the ancillary space, which is basically companies that are involved in the cannabis industry, but are not, you know, cultivating, manufacturing, distributing, or retail. It's much more around technology, compliance, staffing, all these support services. You know, the the common refrain is, is picks and shovels. You know, when you think about the gold rush, you know, taking that sort of approach to looking at the cannabis industry. And what 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 got me really excited was was a multitude of reasons. One is that being private just already you had a lot more reasonable valuations than what you were looking at in the in the public space. Two, you were dealing with a lot less competition in, in the verticals you were um, uh, targeting. Um, and then three, you were seeing a, a lot of these entrepreneurs from similar business lines in the past now seeing an opportunity in the cannabis space. So you were getting real pedigree talent coming in and looking to establish these businesses. And, and what I also loved about it um, is that you know, unlike other industries and, and in tech in, spe- in particular, we're often referring to, you know, this is going to be such a disruptive technology. This is going to change the way things are done. We're in cannabis. We're so fortunate. We're not we're not dealing with that. Right. We're actually laying the foundation. You're creating the the the, the landscape for how businesses operate here. So a lot of the businesses that we've ended up investing in, you know, have started to become ubiquitous and, and, and leaders in their particular segments, which also, you know, got me really excited because 
obviously you can make a real strong impact if you come in really early into some of these spaces. And I think that's the the, the area that, that we found most exciting. So yeah, the fund only invests in, in private deals and, and more specifically, you know, only invests in the ancillary segments. Maybe walk me through to the extent you can. And if you can't, that's cool too. One, what is the traditional check size? Are you guys kind of series A, et cetera? I know you had a big news announcement this past week, partnered up with Tiger. But uh, what, what's the traditional kind of business stage you're looking at? Is it multi-stage? And how do you kind of envision y'all's involvement? Are you trying to get on a board seat and are you trying to be passive? What's the, what's the general investment process? We are, as you sort of mentioned, I think we've transitioned into a, a stage agnostic model now. Whereas domain experts, we feel really qualified to be doing early stage seed checks all the way up to a sort of you know, growth check, which is probably what you're referring to in a in the in the sort of fifty million dollar transaction we did we did with Tiger Global in a in a business called Metric, and I think you know when we started it was much more focused on early stage, and to be honest, it's all kind of early stage, right? Like the industry is just getting going, but I think as we evolve, we we definitely want to be more stage agnostic because we think we're in the best position to to assess any of these businesses, and then in terms of proactivity, we're incredibly proactive. We lead most of the transactions we're involved in. We take board seats or at the minimum board advisors in, in every deal we're involved with. And I think more and more as we grow our, our business and you know, have some years under us, we're much more a strategic partner to our portfolio companies. So I think what we bring to the table is an incredible amount of now a bit of institutional knowledge in the space, having gone through you know 15 odd transactions, working with you know uh, uh, folks sort of across the board and, and bringing that expertise from a business development standpoint or even for you know fundraising purposes we like to be very hands-on and I think that's uh, aside from from capital I think that's what attracts portfolio companies to to Casa Verde. Is, is there any sort of portfolio companies you can kind of walk through the thesis um, that you feel comfortable with? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I'll give you an example. You know, one of our businesses is a company called LeafLink. LeafLink has now quickly become the leading wholesale marketplace for retailers and brands. So think about it like Amazon, but instead of instead of it being consumer facing, this is business to business. So retailers, dispensaries are on the platform and they're reviewing the brands that are on the platform and they're replenishing their inventory for their stores. And on the surface, that sounds like a a pretty straightforward business and and makes a lot of sense. I think you would be surprised to learn that there actually aren't that many of these businesses in traditional industries that have any real market share. And again, to my earlier point, you know, what what LeafLink's been able to do is really create this ubiquity of, of how wholesale transactions take place. And so, you know, they started in Colorado in one market you know, doing a a few million dollars a a month in in transactions on their platform. They've now grown to multiple states doing tens of million dollars of transactions a month on their platform and have brought on thousands of retailers and thousands of brands. And and slowly what you're moving to, again, like we talked about, is this is this idea of ubiquity, which is just that this is how wholesale transactions take place in cannabis. And it's much more easier. It's much more streamlined. And you're you're able to have this sort of tech forward industry because we're building it from scratch. So, you know, LeafLink is a great example of that. And, and we could see that early on because we assessed how our brands doing business now, how are brands able to get in front of retailers and then also the opposite. And, and what we were seeing in our sort of diligence was that retailers were having to make phone calls, text, email. There was no set sort of parameters on how they were reordering inventory or dealing with their brands. And LeafLink has now been able to sort of establish a a bit of that centralized uh, portal, you could call it. So that's one where, you know, we've been incredibly active and involved early and has has had a tremendous result. Can I talk you into one more? Yeah, please. Um, we're, We're also really, we're huge believers and, and we're really excited about, you know, maybe a boring theme to most, but is exciting for us, which is, which is compliance. I think that is the core of what makes the cannabis industry so different than other industries. And honestly, what makes cannabis one of the most transparent industries in the world. When a market legalizes cannabis, and we saw this first with, with Colorado, you know, starting in 2013 and 14, they want to make sure that 
you know, they're able to properly track and trace the entire industry and ensure that, you know, product is not moving off into the black market or that for health and safety reasons, they know what's happening because, you know, people have trepidation. Cannabis moving into the legal framework is a, is a new thing. So the way they tackle that is a whole Basically, if you're a licensed business in, in the cannabis industry, meaning starting from cultivation all the way up to retail and in between, you have to report almost on a daily basis back to the state government as to the movement of all your product. So, you know, if we're talking about a plant in most recreational states, the, the, the form of tracking is through RFID tags on the plant. And then that it's traced throughout its growth as, you know, leaves are falling, as buds are growing, is it being dried, is it being trimmed, is it being packaged, is it being warehoused or shipped? You know, it needs to be tracked at every moment and has to, to, to push that back into the state system. So as we looked at this space, you know, we realized that someone's going to have to come and make this process a little bit easier for customers because this is onerous for big pharma, let alone SMEs in the space. And so a number of our investments have been in businesses that, that provide some functionality that's useful to, to, their, to their client, but also automates the compliance needs for that business. So we were investors in Greenbits, which is a, a point of sale, you know, not too much different than, than something like Square. But again, automates compliance on the back end. So the retailer remains compliant just by using, you know, this point of sale versus, you know, another or a more generic mainstream counterpart. We invested in another business called Trellis, which focuses on inventory management and again, offers that automation of compliance to the cultivators. And then most recently, Metric, you know, which was our largest check to date in the space, that is actually that state government compliance platform that's you know most dominant in, in adult use states, which which people are having to report into. And so that was another investment we made. So we're big fans of, of compliance. I, I can sympathize being a SEC FINRA registered company. Yeah, and, and exactly. We, our biggest line item is is basically legal and compliance. So I think that's right on. Where are you guys in the life cycle of deploying your capital? Is it I think you recently closed the first fund this year, are you halfway through or are you totally deployed a quarter of the way through? We've deployed quite a bit. So, you know, we're in 15 companies. We've followed on in many of them. You know, I think you were asking, you know, on, on check sizes that it varies from sort of half a million dollars all the way up to millions of dollars, depending on the particular transaction. So we've been in, incredibly active and, and, and deployed quite a bit. Yeah, the fund closed last year. And I think we've done, you know, nine transactions already this year. So it's been very active for us. Does this include any of your entrepreneur elevator pitch potential companies? I was laughing because <laughs> I, I was enjoying watching listeners. This was like a Shark Tank style show where uh, entrepreneurs would would have 60 seconds in an in a elevator to, uh, to pitch a crew. And I was laughing because one guy was coming up with a valuation of like $200 million. And then the very next one was like a company doing half a million in revenue that was trying to sell part of the company for a market cap of like 500 grand. It could not have been more of a barbell like situation. And to be fair, that's like, that's a very representative of what the cannabis market is. You know, it's, it's still very dislocated. It's unclear what valuations should be. And, you know, again, we we're very valuation sensitive. We try to bring people back to earth all the time. Uh, and, and, you know, if it's too outrageous, we, we, we won't, uh, we definitely won't engage, but no, unfortunately, Casa Verde did not invest in, uh, in any of those elevator pitches that you saw on that show. What, what do you think as you look forward, you know, in the coming years, is there anything, if there's entrepreneurs listening to this podcast in this space, is there anything that you say, man, this is this is missing, that, that there's an area in cannabis, you know, ecosystem that, man, it's just a great opportunity and I wish some entrepreneurs are tackling that just doesn't have a great kick-ass business model or, or application yet? Is there anything that you think is, is really got a lot of potential? Yeah, I think there's still a number of areas that need a lot more innovation and, and great entrepreneurs to, to solve problems. I mean, there's some obvious ones, you know, financial services until we get full federal legalization. You know, there's a lot of opportunity there to, to start solving for payments or, or banking solutions. We're very conservative as we, as we think about, about those spaces because, you know, one of, one of my key qualifications for an investment is uh, I'm looking for companies that are going to be, you know, a, a big part of the cannabis industry for the long term, right? Not solving some 
short-term issue. So that doesn't mean that if you come in and, and, and have a payment solution, it doesn't mean that you're immediately going to be displaced by more mainstream players when things open up. I think there really is an opportunity to be you know, the leader in the cannabis space and then potentially be acquired by one of those players or, or compete head-to-head. So financial services, I still think there's a lot to do on the compliance end. You know, we're, we're still looking at that space. We haven't made any bets in the ag tech space. I think that is really interesting, right? For the first time in, in a long time, you now have a really high value crop. So that usually drives innovation as people now need to continue to, to, to focus on, on, on how to be more efficient in, in production. And then we made our first biotech investment, which was a, a, also a co-investment with a, with a large strategic uh, imperial brands, one of the largest tobacco companies out of, out of the UK, um, in a business called Oxford Cannabinoid Technologies, which is starting to explore you know, how unique formed cannabinoid compounds can start to attack the, some of the largest you know, indications in the world from pain to cancer to gastrointestinal, et cetera. Obviously, the, the medicinal side of, of the cannabis industry is very exciting, but a lot of it is based on you know, anecdotal feedback rather than clinical research. So I think that's a, a huge opportunity. You've seen that um, you know, sort of play out with, with certain public names like GW Pharma, but there's there's a lot more to, to explore. And I think, you know, we're, we're super bullish on that end as well. So talk to me, um, you know, as you guys went through the process of raising a fund and closing it and deploying it and probably eventually raising some more funds, hopefully in the future, you know, we have a lot of institutional investors and professional investors listen to this podcast. What was sort of, what has been the interaction response to date? I mean, if I had to guess, and I don't know the answer to this, I would assume most of the interest investors, LPs on your side have been high net worth individuals, family offices, sort of, you know, entrepreneurs and and business people that have sold businesses, because a lot of institutions tend to be uh, pretty cautious about these things. I mean, we've had a a marijuana ETF filed for like three years now, but but none of the custodians will hold the public stocks. What, What has been the institutional response? So I think you're spot on. Definitely our LP base is primarily been made up of, of family offices and, and, and high net worths. Um, I think what's changed, and, and I've seen this at each step of, of the way, uh, you know, over the last few years, is that there's definitely more and more comfort. I would say the more traditional institutions, um, you know, the, the pension funds and the endowments are now at least starting to explore. It's clear they have to learn about the industry. They need to understand who some of the important players are. And while they may not be able to deploy capital this day, you know, it's certainly something that, that will come in the future. So I think they're already starting to do their work and do their research. I think that's been the most incredible thing to me, right, is, you know, there, there's a common refrain that the cannabis industry, you know, moves in, in dog years, everything's accelerated. But it's, it's, it's very true. You know, I remember writing, you know, our investor letter at the end of last year saying, hey, you know, in the process of raising money for this particular company, this was the first time I've really seen genuine interest from the more traditional venture community, right? Uh, All your sort of brand name, you know, name brand institutional venture investors were now taking meetings where six months ago, it was just a simple ignore of the email. And now we've now seen multiple venture firms step into the space and start uh, investing in in companies. And and obviously, you know, Tiger is is one that that we've worked with uh, uh, on a number of transactions. But, you know, I think that just continues and continues to uh, evolve. And once the venture and private equity funds are deploying, then, you know, it'll start moving sort of up the value chain into their major sources of capital. And I think the institutions will, will just have to take notice and, and will have to start, start uh, investing. I think the U.S. based folks will probably be a little will be a little limited in what they can do until there is a real federal regime in place. But I think, um, you know, internationally, as their own countries are starting to, to legalize at a federal level for uh, medicinal or recreational purposes, I think you, you may start seeing uh, activity on that end. And obviously, Canada moving into this space has, again, given a lot of credibility to federal institutions there to start getting active in the space. So I think it's going to start having that, that kind of domino effect. All right. So let's say there's some people listening to this, whether high net worth individuals, institutions that say, all right, Meb, Karen, I'm convinced. I, I love this space. What are some good resources for them to get up to speed? Are there any good websites, books, podcasts, et cetera, that you think 
conferences, et cetera, that you think are good places for people to kind of begin the journey to to really get immersed in the uh, in the cannabis space? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly you know visiting a legal market, walking into a dispensary, understanding just you know even from a consumer standpoint what is happening here and what the experience is, that will give you a lot of insight immediately to start understanding. Oh wow, there's still such a long way to go here, right? Um, even in in more developed markets like you know, California or Colorado. I uh, have a lot of investors who have vacation homes in Aspen. And when legalization took shape in Colorado and they were starting to see cannabis products come out of their dinner parties and things like that, that's when it became obvious and, and clear to them. So I think visiting a legal market is really important if you're not in one. I think it's, it's important to sort of see what, you know, how that's taking shape around the country. In terms of resources, you know, there's a number of cannabis focused media outlets now depending on, on what you want to learn about. We're invested in a couple. One is called Miss Grass, which is much more around a, a female-focused um, uh, media platform um, talking about you know, how, how women are starting to interact with, with cannabis in the various ways and, and products that, that make sense. And another is called Mary Jane, which is much more entertainment, lifestyle sort of focused. But there are a, a few business uh, ones uh, out there as well that you, know, you can quickly Google and a bunch will pop up. I, I actually do definitely recommend going to the co- a conference. The one you mentioned, that is one that we've attended every year, the MJ Biz Conference in Las Vegas. It is by far the largest conference. You really get to get a sense of all the businesses that are that are involved in the, on the expo floor from, you know, cultivations to equipment to brands to software. It, sort of everyone is there. So it's uh, I think it's, it's, it's helpful to to visit there and you can actually have conversations and understand how these businesses function. I think that, you know, the more you're able to really get get comfortable with a few of these few of these spaces and, and, and sort of touch and, and feel the, the industry, you know, the, the more excited you end up getting. Because I think while a lot has happened and the public sort of euphoria would make you think you've missed potentially the, the cannabis opportunity, the reality is that we're still, you know, in very, very early innings for, for what's going to be, you know, an incredible ride. We, uh, we got one more question that we always ask our guests. And that is, as you look back, in your career so far, personally, professionally, et cetera, has there been a most memorable investment or trade that you've been involved with? This could be personal, it could be great, it could be terrible, anything in between, but it's, the, it's usually the first thing that comes to mind is the most memorable investment you've ever made. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll bring this more into you know, my, my old world and, and where you were, uh, you know, where you're currently are as well, and, and more sort of equity side, coming into Goldman and really getting excited about the sort of technology boom that, that we were seeing. And, 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 you know, I joined in, in 04. I was a, and, and also at the same time, learning about the unique financial instruments that you can use to really lever on the upside, the bets you want to make. That to me was 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 brand new. I, I wasn't familiar with, with with options trading. So I bought a lot of long dated calls in Apple starting in, in 2004 all the way, you know, through the through the crisis and made a lot of money doing that, a lot of personal money that way. So that was always fun. And because it was part of what, the what, was, what was the thesis? Was that a old school Peter Lynch? You just loved the the iPad? Uh, no, what the original iPod? What, what was what was the thesis? Yeah, yeah. So you know, what was so interesting. Yes, obviously the iPod was the only real product out there that was gaining market share, and it was really interesting because you know I, I worked on the sales desk there, and one of the best things about being on the sales desk is you get to speak to so many different investors, all the research analysts. You get to be on the calls to understand what investors are thinking and and what they're asking. So it's such a great place if you're excited about public markets, which uh, I've always been. Um, it was a great, great place to, to sort of be. So I remember being on the on the phone with like a super deep value investor who was looking at Apple. And I was just so confused because at that time, you know, at any time, really, everyone would not never think of Apple as a value play, um, maybe only now. Right. Um, and uh, and and, you know, what was interesting about it was their penetration at that point in the non iPod segments, such as the computers, you know, laptops and iMacs and, and, and that world was so irrelevant, but had such great margin 
And as people were adopting the iPod more and more, and the sort of closed end ecosystem would would be, you know the sort of prediction was you it would it would move into the laptops and the and, and the sort of the larger uh, sort of ecosystem from the Apple side was that you didn't have to move that much to see tremendous sort of gains. I think that's what got them excited, and then sort of hearing that, you know got me interested as well. And then, you know, around that time, the iPhone was, was long predicted, um, you know, starting in, starting even in 2004, that, you know, there'd be some ability to add a, you know, phone functionality to what the touchscreen iPod was, or, you know, the, the, the various uh, iterations that were coming out. So I think that's what, what got me excited and helped cover a lot of my recreational expenses over the uh, over the years. I love it because this illustrates why I'm a quant and not a discretionary analyst. I remember the first time my buddy had a iPhone and showing how awesome it was. I was like, you know what? I don't get it. I'm perfectly happy with my Razor, my, my clamshell <laughs> phone. I, I, I don't understand. Uh, little do I know uh, world's first trillion dollar company here in the US. Kern, where can people find more info? They want to see what you guys are up to. They want to follow your writing, your talks, where do they go? Yeah. I mean, our website's the the easiest, casaverdecapital.com. We also, you know, you can follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram, not as active as I should be, but we do try to put out, you know, whenever there's something important or relevant that we're involved with, try to use those uh, those mediums for, for publicity. But yeah, our, our website and any of the social channels are the right way to go. Awesome, man. Thanks. Uh, we'll post show links to all those mebfavor.com forward slash podcast listeners. Current, thanks for taking the time today. Absolutely. Thank you, Meb. Listeners, you can find more at mebfavor.com forward slash podcast. We always welcome feedback at the mebfavorshow.com. Please give us a review. We'd love to hear good, bad, anything in between. Subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, my favorite breaker. Thanks for listening, friends, and good investing. Good investing.